me longer than any other book. Um, writing about whiteness is difficult because uh, it's invisible in some ways. Um, and so trying to look for the thing that influences your life uh, probably more than anything else, but it's kind of unseen in many ways. Um, it's harder than you thought it would be. And I'm gonna, there's some language in here for um, that I'm gonna censor for certain audience. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so the general premise of this is Shania, she's a young woman, uh, a, a girl in high school, um, and she had just lost her grandmother, who was very precious to her, and she has moved to a new city with her mother, and she's kind of trying to recreate her life and try to figure out how to get over the loss of her grandmother. Um, and then she kind of learned some things about her grandmother that challenged the kind of perfect myth that she had in her head about her. Um, and uh, surprise. Um, she races, um, but so this, this book is about racism. So, uh, so yeah, I'm going to start somewhere. Um, Michelle looks at Shania out of the corner of her eye, a subtle up and down. First party, she asks a hint of a smile in her voice. Is it that obvious? Shania looks down at herself once more. Her legs don't look as violent and white now that she's off the bus. Praise Catherine's house is dim. To keep dress though, Michelle says, generous. Shania is about to reply when a man appears before them, hanging out the window of a green car, mouth wide open. He's already passed by the time she catches the words he spews. One had one has two have I'll take all three. There's some obscene there, sorry. Uh, the girls stare after him silently. Who the drives a green car? Michelle says finally. And Shania burst out laughing. Michelle smiles a grim smile and Willa chuckles. The crosswalk seems to walk and the three of them cross the street, making their way, making the rest of their way to Catherine's in silence. Catherine Tain's home is a three-story outrage on a hill at the end of a winding driveway surrounded by a crush of leafy trees. The entire ground level is made of glass and metal, wood and crystal, and Willa opens the door without knocking. Music bursts off. She walks right in, Michelle on her heels. They seem to be on mission. Shania hesitates and then follows them inside where barred kids sprawl on couches and plush rugs. There are no cardboard boxes crowding the edges of the room. The baseboards aren't gray with several tenants worth of dust. The house and the people in it seem to shine. Look who's here, Willis, Willis says next to her, nodding at a chestnut-haired boy coming out of what must be the kitchen. He has a slice of pizza on a plate and edges along the perimeter of the party with the look of someone who wants to go unnoticed. Who's that, Shania says. Benjamin Tane, Prescott and Kathleen's brother. Wait, there's a third Tane? Does he go to bar? There's actually a fourth Tane too, Willow says. Older though, dad's first marriage, rich. But no, Ben opted for public school. Kathleen and Prescott unofficially hate him, the red-headed sheep. He doesn't have red hair, Shania says, period. No, but like, you know, the red-headed stepchild, the black sheep, like he's not actually a step, whatever, he ruined my job. <laughs> Shania, I'm sorry, Shania says, shrugging. I haven't seen him since last year, Michelle says. He got cute. He was always cute, Will Connors. Says the gay girl, which makes my taste even more trustworthy. <laughs> He's cool too, though. Comes to the library sometimes. We've been talking more. They drift off, and Shania's too shy to follow, which leaves her leading her way through, the, through people whose faces she knows but don't know her. Parties, and especially this one, make her feel like an alien zipped into flesh. She drifts outside, trying to look human. You came! Catherine's voice rises over the music and party chatter, and Schneider turns to find Catherine beelining toward her through the crowd, drink in hand. Catherine pauses, assessing Schneider's dress. You're so fancy. I, I'm coming for dinner, Schneider wise. If Catherine hears the lie in Schneider's voice, she plows right past it, painting her drink. Hey, babes, feel free to take your shoes off. They look like they hurt. I can't wear heels anymore. I have bunions. My mom says I'll need surgery at some point, but if I did it now, I'd have to be past or whatever, and I have to get a field hockey, so if I live, that, I'll wait. I didn't know you played field hockey, Shania says. She did, in fact. But this was a conversation with two of her grandmothers. Be polite, be curious. Shania remembers Graham smiling in the garden. Then she was slumping on the ground. Shania shakes her head, returning to the conversation. But Catherine has already moved on from field hockey, leading Shania toward a table where drinks are stacked. There's food in the kitchen, too, Catherine says, clapping her hand toward her beast of a home. Pizza and sh uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, saw, I saw your brother with some. Ben. Oh, Ben made an appearance. Shocking. Honestly, Shania, my family is the worst. I have two brothers, considered hot, but people not related to them. Both are different versions of the mind, 
Why couldn't I have sisters? We could have been like the sexier version of the Bents. <laughs> Who? <laughs> I'm prejudiced Shania. I'd be Elizabeth, the list of smoked weed. <laughs> Having Catherine talk directly to you, Shania realizes, is sort of like standing in the path of a grinning hurricane. Catherine passes her a drink. Where's that dress from? And Catherine says, changing the years. Shania tells her, and Catherine nods several times. I always see that account on Instagram, but I don't think my boobs are big enough to make anything they have look good. You don't really have that problem, so that's cool. Get through you, get through your boobs. <laughs> Thanks, I guess, Shania says. She can feel her spine loosening. She slips her wedges off, bends down, and clutches them in her drinkless hand. I can be normal, she insists to herself, a new normal. Someone whose throat doesn't close around a sob when she smells bread or sees a people. Someone who goes to parties and laughs. More spill is in the past. This is now. Someone cranks the music in a pop song she not vaguely recognizes, booms out over the pool, jerking her back into the moment. She, wears, she swears the water ripples. Catherine points at someone Shania can't see near the house and yells, yeah, and approve of the musical selection. Turning and shimmying her shoulders playfully, her blonde dreadlocks flip left and right as she swings her head and tongue to the beat. Her smile is infectious, her tan convincing, and her teeth white as a puppy's. She's the right kind of friend, Shania thinks, the kind of friend who's like confetti over your life. Shania lets her shoulders loosen and sways a little to the music, trying to look as carefree as Catherine Tang absolutely is. The song transitions into a bass second rap song, and Catherine dra- grabs a drink off the table, holding it aloft and wiggling her hips. Michelle, she cries, throwing her head back like a wolf. Dance with me. Michelle looks up from where she's sitting by the pool with Willa. She sits cross-legged at the edge rather than putting her feet in. She smiles at Catherine, but it's a guarded smile, delicate like a cathedral window. She waves Catherine off and doesn't move. Michelle, teach me how to twerk, Catherine says, galloping over to the pool and reaching down to tug on Michelle's wrist. Come on, I love this song, teach me. Michelle's church smile tightens, like the glass it's made of as a counter a pebble, a hairline crack spreading across it. Beside her, Willa has stiffened. She's been twirling her hair around her wrist, but now she lets it flop free, a curtain of fire over her shoulders. Her eyes dart over to the house and back at Catherine. I don't know how, Shania said, sees Michelle now say. She can't hear her. Come on, of course you know how. Teach me it's work, Michelle. Willow leans in and whispers something to Michelle. Her mouth twisted to an angle that communicates a kiss. Having no luck pulling Michelle to her feet, Catherine backs away, dropping her hands to her knees and jerking her hips left and right. Her smile is star bright, the drink in her cup spilling onto her bare feet. Willow and Michelle maneuver to the edge of the party. Catherine's laughter carries over the music, and then Blake and Amy and other people laugh too at the absurdity of it, at the welcome feeling of shared shame transforming into pride. Shania knows one must be careful in moments like these. Laugh too much, or stand too close, and the lens can shift quickly. Then it'll be Shania. Can you twerk? Let's see. And Shania's not a girl like Catherine, to whom a blush is a tool or a trick. A blush for Shania is a falling domino, which will then lead to her entire chest turning strawberry, her voice squeaky, her armpits sway. While the song booms on, she edges carefully sideways, making her way around the water to the bottom. Dear Duke, stop.
Stop doing karate and flexing your tiny bicep on the playground. Stop buzzing your hair and leaving your bangs long. Stop wearing soccer cleats and tube socks to school. Stop looking through me like you can see the field behind me. Stop telling your little sisters to pinch me as hard as they can with the sharp corners of their nails. Stop smiling at Amelia. Stop making that dimple appear on your left cheek. Stop pretending you didn't get the pink letter I kissed and sent to you after I looked up your address in the phone book. Stop pushing your forearm to mine on the playground, saying a brown skin can't marry a white skin. I am the kickball player. I am over the hedges, out of bounds, and you, with arms above your head, run the bases triumphant. and into the Oldham Avenue house. We played in all the front yards like they were ours. Flashlight tag and flapping, lightning bugs dead in our hands for that toxic glow. Then that rattled boy across the street asked if I was one of those orphans from TV. Before that, I thought we were all the same kids, same sized houses, same bus to school. Suddenly, we were brown and they weren't. I let out a sharp vowel and stomped back to our front door between the hedges, into the house where our da dark-skinned dad never showed, the house where mom moved to be with her pale, bearded boyfriend. But that kid's voice at my back, still asking his dumb question in the streetlights, it kept ringing in the dark like cicadas. Little voice outside our window, well, is she? bruising me in ways I didn't yet understand. And every summer after, a worrying reminder that I didn't belong here, a little song sung at me by the bodies that slept for years underground, how we couldn't see what he saw, two brown girls under a white couple's roof. Playlist. 
a car full and all the windows down. Take a right on Military Pike, where the traffic lights and rules start to disappear. The roads narrow and undulate, and all our stomachs flip while we breathe smoke like teenage dragons who love Missy Elliott and peaches. Daryl drives 80 and the trees blur. Katie makes a stop and smell the country air. Says, hear that about cicadas whirring. We watch heat lightning clamor against clouds. We pass tobacco barns printed black and gray on color film. The horse fences are music staffs guiding us to a crescendo. There's a road called Frogtown Lane, and in the dark, we swing a sharp left. The hedges grow around us until a clearing. The bodies of rusted old cars and school buses, the ghosts of girls once on dips before us, red-eyed and smokeful and lungs blaring lyrics. We reverse to escape and find ourselves giddy with relief, and in the stories, we come off braver and bolder than we appear. Instead, these beauties are fair as the flesh crayon I use to color in every 
everyone. Their lips painted pink, their eyes smoky and tilted just so. And maybe I carry this with me for years, watching Miss America pageants, flipping through teen magazines, never seeing myself, but watching my reflection in the car's side mirror, trying to tuck in my lips, fold them against my teeth, thinner, like the other girls at my school, like the girls I see everywhere. Thank you. Sun rays and no sunscreen, fake tans and stories, a boardwalk soap opera. 
all tragedy, all the time. But they're wrong. 100% that is not who we are. The Jersey Shore, according to us, is everything we love. It is sunshine and sea, all salt water and seashells. The shoreline and sunsets sinking into the bay and rise, rising over the ocean. It is surfboards floating on Holyoke Avenue and kids learning to skimboard in the shallow water. Riding waves from the time the lifeguards arrive until they pack it up each night. And afterwards, building sand castles that topple and fade. Digging holes enough to bury ourselves up to our necks and then breaking free. The ice cream truck that rips down Center Avenue and the Ferris wheel that reaches up to the sky at Fantasy Island. The bumper cars and dragon roller coaster we ride dozens of times on pay one price Friday nights. It is pizza slices from Bay Village and Swedish fish from the ship's wheel in Harvey Cedars. It's cheesesteaks with barbaroo and wait night at the chicken or the egg, but no one calls it that. So it's wait night at the chegg and everyone is there. The kids you grew up with, the ones you can't stand anymore, and the ones you love because home is some of the time complicated. It's paddle boarding and afternoon kayaking off the end of the island in Holgate. It's walking and skateboarding and surfing and running and riding bikes with no shoes on. Your feet getting tough and rugged enough to get through anything. Feeling free and loose. It's drifting and floating and almost sinking, but someone pulling you up just in time. This is the place we all grew up and grew into who we are. It's locals and tourists that's born here and just visiting. And for those of us who were born right here in Long Beach Island, New Jersey, this place is our own. We call it home. Clam Cove Reserve. This is the place that stays on our minds. 24 acres of coastal marshland that sits just outside our doors. Basically, our backyard. The place we have spent every day of our lives, it was always considered sacred, our safe space. The land preserved for so many animals and species, songbirds, osprey, egrets, herons and gulls, ducks, mussels and blue crabs, and especially the northern diamondback terrapins. Nesting habitats for the native turtles to this coast, and more than that, it is a space to protect and secure, safeguard against the elements. When the storm wrecked everything, it pushed sand from the ocean beaches here, and everything changed. The developers looked at this spot as theirs, saw it ruined and trashed, and so they saw buildable lots with multi-million dollar price tags, and families buying up land that would change the shape of everything, and put the island at risk of overdevelopment, and put the natural habitats at risk of destruction, and put the turtles at risk of extinction, and our whole way of life at risk of disappearing. about this lot, these lives we are living, all the many injustices that are happening, the trauma that's happening, and yet there are all of these ways to search and find joy, or to fall in love, or to find friendship, find community. So there is, there's a love story here. And I, I wanted to, you know, when I was in high school, love was what it was all about. You wanted to find the love story. So this is a, a I'll just give you a little taste of it. This is her and her friends getting ready to hang out, go out. Party tonight. Issa says, with Zach trailing behind, snapping me out of my imagination. I'm too tired, I say, begging off. I can feel my bed calling to me. I'm out. But maybe next week? No, no, no. You said this was the summer you'd be free, Issa reminds me. You said this was the summer you were going to be wild, Zach says, grabbing a french fry from my plate. You said this was the summer you were going to get loose and make out with whoever you wanted to, Mia adds, laughing with them now. I did not say all of that, especially not the making out part. There's no way I, they stare at me. Okay, maybe I said it. But it was the stress from school talking. I'm good now. I don't need to be kissing anyone to make me someone to remember. They stay staring at me. We're just saying, Zach says, it's been a whole week of summer and we only really have nine weeks left. You know I've been keeping track of that. Nine weeks until senior year and we, especially you, haven't done anything except work and volunteer for the island. You can't let the whole summer go to waste and not do something for you. Zach has a way of making things a bit more dramatic than they really are, but in some ways they're right. A summer without a little fun isn't really a summer at all. You've got to be there, Mia adds, all of them teaming up now. Fine, you're right, you're right. 
I can't let summer go to waste. I'll go. So they do. She goes to the party. Uh, I'm going to read one quick uh, uh, a love poem that I feel like. So Milo Harris, is, there's, there's some, it, there are some, there's some drama between uh, Milo Harris, who she, who she falls for, and he wants to, her to teach, her, uh, teach him how to surf. This is from that. How to ride. They're right, I say. It's just about instinct, balance. I add, moving my board closer to him. I hold his steady. Tell him to be patient. Go slow as he eases his body on top to sit. And then we're face to face. The sun washing over both of us. The ocean slow and steady beneath. Feel it. You can watch for it. Put my palms to the water as it floats me up, then down. You want to catch the wave just as it rises, just as it pulls up, I say. Looking out, remembering to stop being afraid. Pushing myself to believe the ocean does not want to hurt me or us. Soon as it rises, you have to paddle fast as you can to get under it before it crashes, before it washes away. If you do that, you can ride it for what feels like forever. And so it was loosely based on Hurricane Sandy, which my family uh, lived through on Long Beach Island. And her family, uh, they, many of her friends and, and her community uh, loses almost everything. So this is part of the hurricane, and I'll close with a short from the recovery. Flashback. What to leave behind five years ago? What would you carry with you? What would you leave behind? Is this the end of the world as we know it? How do we survive the end of the world? What will be left when we return? What will we even return to? Who will be left alive? What will be left standing? Can we ever come back? What will be lost? How can we return if there is nothing left? Endless. Panic sets in. Wind whips wild outside our door. No electricity now. Nowhere to hide. Nothing to protect. We gather together and say we will never let go. Arms linked, hustle around so loud we can't hear or think our thoughts jumble. All of us crying now and can't help myself can hear the rush of water outside. Outside is heavy, flooding. I lose my footing, we run. The water rushes past us, soaks my shoes and feet drenched all over. Mom and Dad tell us to run, to get to the car and fast. We try. I am only 12. Ada is 10, Jack is 6, I am in charge. We rush, ocean and bay pushing up around us fast, fast, fast. No way we can leave, no way we can stay. Hurry. Can't keep up, can't hold my ground, lose Jack's hand. He stumbles loose from my grip, gets caught in the tide that is pushing us. The street already full of waves and salt swirling and ripping around us. He falls in the water. I scream his name, Jack, Jack. Tell Ada to hold on to the car door and not move. My dad runs outside, hears me screaming, Jack tumbling, turning, his arms waving us to him. He keeps losing balance, lost in the water. My heart is sink, sinking in my chest. The tide's twisting and turning him, pushing his body. He can swim, but is struggling, dunking under again and again. All I see is my brother disappearing, only to appear again. How do I go deep without drowning? Grab from his arm, his leg, anything to hold on. I am reaching, reaching. He is sinking, sinking. Dad, I holler, help now. <laughs> I'll close with uh, just, just thinking about recovery and what to do in, in this changing climate in the world and, and how to balance all the things that, that weigh on us and that we navigate through. This is one of the last poems from the recovery. We hustle, we work, we clean, we remake, we cry, we weep, we laugh, we moan, we ache, we sleep, we swim, we walk, we bleach, we sweep, we empty, we fold, we rinse, we repeat, we rinse, we order, we rush, we push, we press, we bulldoze, we hold, we crush, we crowd, we carry, we cling, we catch, we move, we pack, we sing. We dance, we rally, we hope, we sweat, we pray. We show up again the next day. Mm. Thank you.
Governor's School for the Arts. Let's say that. <laughs> Because there was a deadline and there was a book, it was like, these are these poems now. And people 
people are reading that and they're done. I'm not gonna mess with them anymore, you know? Um, so that's my answer is they're never done, but sometimes they have to be done. Yeah. <laughs> I like all everything they just said. Check, check, go sign. Uh, I know, I, yes, I think there's, I, I, I think when you publish books, sometimes the older you get, uh, I'm 43 now, so I had poems that I was writing in my 20s. I definitely had moments where I had to make peace with poems that I was like, oh, were they done? And are they out in the world? And yep, yeah, okay, well, I'm just gonna be, make, say it's okay, that's who I was at that age, and that's what I needed to say. And figure out how do you, uh, you know, I, there, I got such good advice from a poet and writer, Willie Perdomo, who was like, you can't keep working on the same thing forever. You, you gotta move on, because that one book will bleed into the next book and the next book. And it was, it's the smartest thing I ever heard because it, it made me, forced me to say, this is okay for this book to have closure and this book to be, to, to be finished. Uh, but like Olivia said, I'm editing, and even as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, okay, can I move this around? Uh, I, I did, recorded the audio book for this. And there were several poems that I would change as I was recording. They were like, excuse me, ma'am, uh, you cannot <laughs> change the book. <laughs> Of like, there's no skipping steps. 
steps. You know, if you, you want to be good at something, you got to really take the time to do it. And I've been writing my entire life, and I kind of forgot those early steps that really clumsy is the early, like, sucky things, right? Um, which is not to say that my work is great as soon as it comes out. You know, it's, yeah, you still suck as a writer in the first draft, sure, but, like, it's a different feeling, you know, being comfortable versus starting with a camera, um, which is just a completely different world for me. So the, the visualness of it um, doesn't really, I feel like it doesn't change the way I write, but the practice of it does. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Ask me in like a year. <laughs> we'll go see what that is.
me hearing myself say it. So reading out loud over and over, the picture of something here, and I said, um, it definitely wasn't black folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, folks, uh, we are going, to, we, uh, we need to close the bookstore. <laughs> uh, so uh, I would love to bring this discussion back into the room in a more casual, sort of mingly sort of situation. But I very much encourage everybody to get copies of the book if you don't already have one. Really terrific work. Get a copy for yourself and one for a Christmas present for your best friend of each book. <laughs> um, and then please feel free to hang out here until about 8.30 and uh, we, we'd, love, we'd love to have you, everybody meet each other. So uh, again, thank you to our authors for coming here. It has been a tremendous evening and thank you for everybody in the crowd for being here as well. Um, I look forward to shaking everybody's hands. Uh,